are. Thank you for joining us in this uh, round table. I'm Carolina Sambo, and I am, I am an associate researcher at the National Scientific and Technical Research County, CONICET from Argentina. And I'm the coordinator of the Center for Studies on, Inter on Transnational Organized Crime in the University of La Plata. Um, this roundtable today will be about some of the main and preliminary findings, I may say, of a project that has been um, granted by the Latin American Studies Association and the Ford Foundation. The, this uh, project explores women in criminal organizations, particularly in the cases of the Brazilian Primero Comando da Capital, um, First Command Capital, and the Mexican Cartel Jalisco Nueva Generación, Cartel Jalisco New Generation. So today uh, we will have, unfortunately, one of the main researchers of the project, uh, Nicole Shen. Uh, she's sick, so she is not able to be here. But we come with Marcos Alan Ferreira, who is the other principal investigation um, with me, and with Ana Beatriz Ramalo Carba eh, Gonzalez. Me disculpa, I'm sorry. Um, and she is one of the assistant researcher, and she has done a very impressive um, field work with us. So first of all, I would like to introduce you our um, the members of the roundtable, and then they will start with a little kickoff uh, introduction about the topic we are going to discuss, and then we will be answering some questions. Please be welcome um, to join us and ask whatever you feel comfortable with in the Q&A you have uh, on the bottom on, on the, of the screen. So first of all, it's my pleasure to share the floor with Marcos Alan Ferreira. Uh, he is an associate professor at the Department of International Relations at the Federal University of Paraíba in João Pessoa, Brazil. And also he's a visiting professor at Masters at the Masters Program in Social Development of the University NUR in Bolivia. And he holds a PhD in social sciences and he was a visiting researcher for the University of Manchester and the Uppsala University and the University of San Paulo. On the other hand, we have uh, Ana Beatriz Ramalho. She is uh, currently the coordinator of federal resources uh, for humanization at the Penitentiary Administration Public Office of the State of Maranhão in Northern Brazil. Um, she uh, holds a master's degree in political sciences and international relations, and she has a bachelor in international relations too. So thank you so much, both of you, for being here. Uh, it's a pleasure uh, to join your, the round table with you. So please, Marcos, if you could start with the kickoff, I would very much appreciate it. Uh, thank you, Carolina, and thank you for all attendees that are that joined us in this roundtable. And I'm very happy to see and uh, just make a general comment and how this topic on women, women in and criminal organizations and crime in general are being discussed in this important event. And we see a lot of panels and also book um, release. And, and we are happy to see that this important topic has been even more discussed. And as introduced by Carolina Sampo, this, uh, this round table presents some partial results of our research funded by uh, Ford Foundation and Latin American Studies Association, in which Carolina Sampo, Nicole Jen, and I and suggested a uh, uh, research and on how is the roles of women, women in Primero Comando da Capital, PCC, and Cartel Jalisco Nova Generación from Mexico. And uh, what I will introduce here is some of the theoretical discussion that 
at Grounded Our Research. And then Ana Beatriz Ramalho will present a little bit about uh, our case of PCC and of course in the Q&A and also answering the, the comments. Carolina can add more information about these. No? And so in this research, we, we started and, and first of all, and making a literature review about uh, women and criminal organizations. And quite interesting that in, in general, um, the, the literature, uh, first of all, focus on how the woman is criminalized. You know? And in general, they're not in general, but so a part of the literature, for example, developed the idea that the women um, engage in, in criminal organizations or crime in general in search of some income and sometimes with difficulties to, uh, to help their children, but also because they, their connection with the partners that are linked with criminal organizations in some way. You know? and, and, and this is interesting because and this share of literature connects directly the involvement of women in, in crime with the um, social development at all. No? And, and this brings interesting reflection on how important it is not to be, not necessarily focused only in repression and the public policies on security, but also to think the role of development of the societies when we talk about the role of uh, women in the crime in general. No? And we have in the popular literature several um, um, ways in which the, the women is presented in crime. And I remember, for example, a movie that probably uh, several of the people that's here attending knows that Maria Full of Grace, a Colombian and North American production that, for example, shows the women connected and with the transportation of drugs from Latin America to other parts of the country. And part of literature also shows this, you know, that in, in general, the women and uh, work in low profile uh, activities or not high ranking in the criminal organizations, but sometimes working in the transportation and these uh, activities in general that's not necessarily connected um, with the high rankings of criminal organizations. And, but particularly uh, when we, we see the case of Primeiro Comando Capital, as Ana Beatriz will show for us, uh, in the case in, that we based in several interviews that we did in Sao Paulo State, both in Sao Paulo, but also in Santos, that's a city in the coast where is the main part of Brazil and, in, and the PCC, PCC is very strong and have a strong governance in the peripheries, but also in the port itself. We see that um, some changes in this role of women in the, in the criminal organization. It's not only this image that we, in general, are used to connected um, with the transportation of drugs or um, necessarily linked to the inequality of the societies in general, but little by little we see also some important roles that women is, is doing in these organizations. And, not, and what is interesting, and I think it is, uh, we see in both cases of Cartel Jalisco, but also PCC, and we'll focus my, um, the minutes I have in, in this aspect in particular, uh, that's the role that the women has in the money laundering in, this, in these organizations in particular. No? And for example, in some interviews that we conducted in Sao Paulo, both Ana Beatriz and I, and the, the people from judiciary branch in Sao Paulo that works with organized crime, it's quite clear that this, uh, this role in money laundering is very important to Primeiro Comando da Capital. And, in, and with women that not necessarily is enrolled in the organization or listed in the, uh, in the all Excel spreadsheets that PCC have of the members, 
but they work uh, on the margins and, for example, buying and apartments and houses and land, and that works to launder the money that PCC uh, deal nowadays in uh, drug trafficking, but not own oh, the Mercomanda Capital. Uh, just important to mention, especially if you have um, some students uh, that have this first contact with the organization, that the main business is the drug trafficking. But when we think, for example, the role of Mercomanda Capital in Amazon Forest, for example, they are engaged in other issues, like, for example, uh, exploring uh, illegal mining and also sexual exploitation in this uh, illegal uh, mining place and so on. And uh, it's interesting to see that this the women has an important ro important role in this in these organizations. I think this serves both to Cartel Jalisco, but also to First Capital Commando, Primeiro Commando da Capital, that um, to be the people that will be in the front uh, of money laundering in these organizations in particular. And not only money laundering, but also not being a member of the organization, they can also serve in particular roles that can serve uh, strategically to organization, like, for example, to serving as lawyers to the, to the criminal organization, for example. You know? And Beatriz and I tried to make some contact with lawyers that's connected in some way with the PCC. In the first moment, they, they are open to speak, and then we, they, they were not too open as we imagined, because uh, they don't want to, to to have this image connected, but it's quite clear that the organization sometimes pays uh, the undergraduate program, pays uh, lawyers, women in particular, to, to work in, this, in these roles. And also um, the woman can, uh, can be very strategic, for example, in the visits uh, that Brazilian law uh, allows and to the woman dues in, in the prisons. And sometimes the, the, the members, the key members of PCC says that is a partner, not necessarily being a partner sometimes, but they say that's a partner to have this contact with the lawyer and the lawyer also serving in the organization. So to, to not extend too much my, and my participation here. And we see that uh, we have an important literature and in general, connecting this role of women in criminal organizations. But it's important to see that each case is one case, as we see in Portuguese sometimes. No? And it's very difficult to generalize that it always is the same way, like we see in the Hollywood movies and so on. We see that this uh, the role of women in criminal organizations and even more complex will depend and which uh, are the needs of the criminal organizations. And in the case of Primeiro Comando Capital and Cartel Jalisco, they know how to use these gender roles very strategically uh, to women work for the organization or for the development of the organization. I, I will uh, stop here in, the, in this nice first um, initial uh, ideas, and then we can discuss more about some specific topics that I developed here in this first part. Thank you so much, Marcos. I, it is very interesting to hear um, what you said. Uh, I, I would like to make some comments before uh, giving the, the, the word to Beatriz. Um, we were in a, in a round table very early in, in this morning, in our morning, uh, and we were discussing many of these um, relations and women position in different criminal organizations in different regions. Uh, I talked about Latin America and I talked about um, a work in progress with um, Valesca Troncoso and Antonella Paparini. Um, we work uh, on the frame of this project, so that's why I bring it up. Uh, and I would like to add that um, on the one hand, we know that women is, are not only present at the bottom of the pyramid, so to call it, um, taking care of logistics, taking care of a small business, taking care of caregiving, 
but they are also present in other parts. They are also present in middle and high rate positions. Of course, that may vary from country to country and from organization to organization. And I think that it's very interesting to try to understand, uh, especially in very uh, patriarchal and machista societies, and especially in the case of Mexico, uh, but also in others in, in, in our region, um, how that gender norms replicated or not inside the criminal organizations. And one of the main findings of our research is that gender norms are present, but not necessarily replicate as we see from the outside. And it's very interesting because there is a bias, um, a very clear bias from the policy word analysis from the law enforcement, from the criminal justice system. And as a result, women are not under the spotlight of those uh, agencies. And as Marcos was saying, um, as a result, they are aware of what is their, their situation and they use it strategically in, that, in their benefit. So even when we can see women um, through stereotypes, like in many cases as extension of males, as the caregivers, as the one that had to take care of the business while their partners or relatives are behind bars or dead. They are much more than that. And that is something that I'm sure you have seen in the field. Um, and certainly in the case of Mexico in general, not particularly in the case of the Cartel Jalisco Nueva Generación, because I don't know that. Um, and unfortunately, as I said, uh, Nicole was not able to join us because he's sick. Uh, but we will have plenty of opportunities to discuss this again. Uh, I would like Ana Beatriz to share with us some of the um, findings or her, of her fieldwork. Thank you so much, Anna. Okay, thank you, Carol. And uh, good night, good evening, good night. I, I don't know for everyone. And uh, despite the uh, Marcus and Carol contributions, uh, my talk will focus on how the gender role is still as, as, a, as an issue to when we talk about uh, women role in criminal organization because when I was in field work and, and researching and I asked uh, what what was the the, the women uh, role in PCC uh, almost everyone I think everyone has uh, answered me that uh, women still don't have the the high uh, uh, they they are not capable to 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 take the main decisions. So the 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 high echelon of PCC is still uh, fulfilled by men. So, um, but as the the professors uh, said, yes, there there are some changes in in the participation of women in criminal organizations. But the gender role is is. Uh, is it still the, that division that we are used to? So the, the women are the, the ones who will take part at the, the basic uh, tasks and the uh, decisions, the, the decision-making, the major ones are, are lead by men. So, but uh, after these, these comments, uh, I'll, I'll have to, to begin with the history of women in PCC. So that's, I think that's, that's important to, to give that a context. And the context was that between 2000 and 2014, there was an increase of 656% of female prisoners in Brazil. And at the same time, through the spread of networks connected to prison, mainly with cell phones, prisons dynamics became more extensive, engaging even more families and women uh, through different forms of criminalization and punishment. So 
one of the main effects of those process, so the networks and the increase of female prisoners, uh, was the absorption of these women in crime dynamics led by PCC from different positions and complex relationships. So it was after this, this scenario that PCC starts to, to engage with women inside the prisons. And uh, after the first mega rebellion, uh, an episode uh, very famous here in Brazil that occurred in 2001, uh, the PCC start to baptism the, the women. So baptism is the ritual to become a member of PCC, an official, an official member of PCC. So uh, during this, this period, the, uh, before this period, uh, women are not, were not allowed to be part of PCC officially. Uh, PCC was founded in, in 1993, so it was almost um, eight years, seven years of existence, but women are not allowed officially to be part of, uh, to be member of PCC as a sister. Sister is the, the name that PCC gives to women that are uh, an official member of, of the group, the gang. And after this, women began to be increasingly mentioned in the press and in special reports about their roles in PCC, placing them as responsible for, as uh, we said here tonight, account management, money laundry, information exchange. And um, these uh, tasks, these, these roles were very important to the function and the link between prisons and streets. So, Women were uh, at the beginning the the one of the the main link in in into this uh, two different dynamics so the streets and the the prisons. Uh, but the, uh, however, the hierarchical principle that uh, places greater value on men's work that our society uh, assigns now. Uh, puts the women to secondary activities. And PCC is the reflection of society. It's not so different. So uh, the, the gender roles, the, the labor, labor division is still present, present in, in the organization. So what we can observe is that the, some, in some prisons in Sao Paulo, I heard in the field work that some sisters are responsible to make the food, to feed the brothers, that is how we call the, the male members of PCC. And why the, these male members are responsible to take the, the main decision, as I said before. So, uh, uh, and besides that, with regard to the attributes necessary for women to be invited to, to join the organization as a sister, it's important to, to have uh, a connection with some important men or to have some characters, some, uh, how can I say, uh, some kind of, of uh, behavior that we can uh, compare it to a man behavior. So when women can, can reflect this man behavior, it's easier to, to become part of the crime. So when, when I talk about men behavior is the, the willingness to, to commit crimes without fear, the, the, the achievements in, in the criminal world, uh, as, we, as we can say, the, the deaths, the, the thieves. So, so that's the, the, what we can say about what, what we can see as a men behavior. So when a woman has a contact with a, a, an important man inside the organization, or when a woman has this kind of, of behavior, it's easier to, to get in, into the, the organization. So the, the gender role or the, the gender mark is still important in, in the beginning of the woman path inside the, the organization. Uh, and in PCC, we have uh, an interesting division of the woman um, the woman role uh, besides the these these uh, these aspects that I was talking before we have the sister the female the the woman that is a, a real member of PCC and we have what they call the sisters in law they are not officially a member of PCC but they are related to a man who is a member of PCC. So 
In Portuguese, we call the cunhadas, the sisters-in-law, and they are not officially in the, a member of PCC, but they have a crucial role in the in the organization. We can say that the sisters uh, is to have the role to guide, to supervise, and decide on daily life of women prisoners when we talk about prisons, when we talk the the person who is behind the bars. And some some works, uh, we can see that uh, they define the, the task of the sister inside the jail as a court of first instance. It's like a, a, a first trail. And because when we have a demand that is considered more complex, it's often forwarded via cell phone or, or other uh, way to a type of court of second instance. Those are how can I say it, as uh, formed by male prisoners that can exercise leadership over these, 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 uh, the first instance where, uh, where women have more agents. So this is the scenario where a sister uh, act inside the jail, but we have the scenario where, where sisters-in-law um, have more agents because they have more contacts, better contacts inside the, the, the organization. They have the, 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 they have the, the contact with the men that are more important or, or it's easier to, to, to achieve, the, to achieve their, their, what they want. So many interviews point that the sisters-in-law have more agents and more privileges but okay, Carol, I am seeing, but they are more supervi uh, supervised, so any mistake can be reported. So there is this this side too, and I want to end my my uh, contribution talking about another issue that we see on field work. That's the sexual conduct of women inside PCC. This is this is a very important issue because. The PCC's laws prohibits homosexual from from be a member, and they are considered like pedophiles, rapists, and other individuals who have committed acts which are rejected by the the criminal world. And lesbians, uh, for instance, will not be very welcome in their organization as they would be considered by PCC uh, members as a reason for disagreement between the couples. So. But the reality is that women become lonely after being arrested, after being behind bars. So even if they are not lesbian before, transgender men in jail are their only companions. So this part of, of women's role in the organization is still an, uh, an important um, thing to mention. So I, I will conclude that uh, being a PCC means being started into power relations in which there are often subordinate to rules and procedures uh, these rules are at the scope of male decision making. So uh, that's it. I hope you, you could understand. Thank and you, Beatriz. We will we get will back get to you. Back. Don't worry. The idea of the round table is that we have the opportunity to intervene more than once. So don't worry. You will have no time to explain uh, further your findings. But first of all, I would like to ask you, and please, Marcos, I will ask you to, to have your answer first. So uh, Beatriz can rest a little bit since we are very few. Uh, which or were the main find, uh, methodological challenges you had to face during the research in general and the field work in particular, and why? And I, I think one important challenge is the male dominance in the issue of um, criminal organizations. And this dominance um, is seen with the people that we interact uh, when, when we are field work, the people from justice, the police, and the, even the researchers. We see a prevalence of men doing this work. And it's very nice to see that this panel is a little bit different, that we have two women and one man here. And this make um, that they have very biased view on the, the women and so on. So this is very difficult. I think that we, if we have more access, for example, of women in PCC would be, would be even um, 
better for our research. And also the, we, ha we had amazing people that we could interview for this research that knows a lot about PCC. And it's incredible that they'll know a lot about the role of women in PCC. <laughs> they, they have a very connected um, view on the repression and how to deal with the organization, but these gender roles is not a, a typical um, issue that they discuss and they don't know precisely about that. And uh, it's interesting that sometimes um, even the interviewees knows about the role of women when the policy is investigating the organization and so on. And or, uh, so a, a, a preventive view about how the women works in the organization is difficult even for the police. So this, uh, this dominance of the, the man in, in the issue make difficult also to have a um, clear perspective. And, and in this regard is very important and some and Ana Beatriz can can complete this. Uh, what I say, uh, it's very important to have this perspective from women that had access to um, uh, PCC members in the female prisons, and these women in particular was key to this research. You know? But I think that Ana Beatriz can can develop more about this because she had more contact with some people that has direct contact with women in female prisons. Thank you, Marcos. Um, just a few notes about that. Um, today, uh, we were discussing the similar issue in different organization and Philly Allen was there. And she always says, and it's one of the, the, the phrases of the book is like, narratives are mainly masculine in general in organized crime. And and the quote is, um, woman is a footnote in organized crime uh, because uh, organized crime has been researched by uh, males mainly. And woman researcher has to do even more effort because we have to, you know, take care of many other things. It's not only about the research and the work and all those stuff. Uh, but I would love to listen the, um, the comments of Ana Beatriz uh, about the field work. So please. Okay, I think that the, the main challenge uh, besides that what Marcos has mentioned is that um, conducting research involving people linked to criminal organization or in jail uh, presents intrinsic challenges. So we can face people who don't want to to share their their um, their knowledge. I can I can say that I actually went through this situation during field research because I tried to contact a former PCC member, uh, and during field research. Uh, through another research, through um, uh, uh, woman research that helped me a lot with a lot of information. But this former PCC member, uh, she preferred not to be interviewed because it's all it's always difficult for those people to to share their 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 experience in this in this area because. Uh, they they fear to to come back to jail. They 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 feel to to be uh, again in this situation or to uh, anyway to to go back to this to this uh, scenario that was uh, once terrible. So I think that this challenge to to have contact with my object is is one of the the main uh challenge that that i i face it and i but it is a as a challenge that when we we start to to study criminal organizations we have to be uh, clear that we, at our mind that we will face these 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 problems that uh it's not uh easy to 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 contact the the object uh and but I am very grateful because uh, female researchers have uh, uh, gave me a lot of information, a lot, uh, have passed me a lot of experiences. So I think that this is one of my, my challenges because I wanted to, to have the, this content, but I, I couldn't. So that is. 
Thank you for sharing, uh, Anavi, at least. Um, also, something that I would like to highlight is the fact that it's very difficult to get data in general regarding the presence of women in the prison, in the prison system, in the criminal justice. Uh, we don't have the data about how many women had been prosecuted and condemned in many Latin American cases. Um, that's why in the research I, I was mentioning, we share with uh, Antonella and Valeska, we had to take some examples for the, from the US justice system because it's the only system that has open that data and we can access to um, how many years did they get and how possible it is to compare um, their sentences, their charges with charges in the case of men in similar positions. So. That's something to bear in mind. We need more data. We need disaggregated data so we can understand which is the role of women in criminal organizations in general. And we also have um, very few evidence around a woman that had been prosecuted in the region and actually condemned in, in many uh, different countries. The fact that um, we only know about, you know, very big cases under the spotlight like Emma Coronel or um, the Queen of the Pacific or Griselda Blanco uh, is talking about how difficult it is to get that evidence. So, um, Marcos, according to the civil war you conducted, um, what do you think is the role of woman in middle and high rate positions in the BCC? And do you think, and, and Ana Beatriz has mentioned something about that, um, it reproduces gender norms? Yes, um, as uh, told by Ana Beatriz, we don't see in the, in the top decisions of BCC um, a strong role of the women. But at the same time, the the way that PCC is organized make the women very strategic for the organization, as I mentioned before, no? especially in the role of finance of the organization. I think this is um, a very important role. Um, what I mean is while and they don't have this decision and, and role in particular in the PCCs, is very concentrated in, in some men, even in the divisions by the state, by the countries is the men. And the decisions from the women is more concentrated in female prisons in Sao Paulo state in particular. And, but this role of the finance is very important. So um, several of the PCC members are uh, that are male in general and don't have any in possibility, for example, to buy a house or an apartment and, and, and make any money in laudering. And because that they very strategic, the lawyers, women, the, the, the daughters, the, the, the partners that can have this important role. So it's, uh, it's quite complex because at the same time that they are not in the high handkins on the decision, they are very important to the for uh, one aspect that's key for the organization. That's the money. That's the finance. No, so just to, to contribute in, the, in this question, this is my perspective from the, this experience in this research. Thank you, Marcos and Anna Beatriz. Apart from the reproduction or not of the gender norms, um, what do you think about? You talk a little bit about how women entering the prison system uh, may transform them, so to call it, into lesbian. But what happened about the relation with the PCC? Because as we all well, we'll all know, uh, at least we know, uh, the PCC is a prison-based system and manage many of the prisons, especially in the state of San Pablo, where you conducted the fieldwork. So... Um, do you think um, there is pressure for women who are not connected to the organization when they enter the prison? I asked this question to the researchers that, that I interviewed 
And they said that when women have to face the decision uh, be part of PCC and keep their relationship, the, the homosexual relationship. Sometimes that they pref prefer to keep the relationship and uh, not be part of PCC because, and there's an a interesting answer because the, the, they can have some, some the same uh, privilege. I, I, I will not say privilege, but, but the same access to drug traffic or, or other things, even not being a member so inside the jail so so the one of the the main answer that the researchers gave me is that there is a tense it's a tense relationship so it's not so easy to to say that only the sisters who are members of pcc have access to benefits inside the jail they said that women who can um, make the right contest, contacts, who can make the, the right speech to the population of the jail, they also have, have uh, prestige. They, they are seen as a, a respectable uh, woman. So when I asked, uh, when the woman had to, to decide to be a member or to keep the relationship most of them, uh, as uh, what was informed to me, prefer to keep the relationship because they are already seen as a respectable uh, criminal. But this is different from, uh, from men. This is a different reality for, uh, from men. The, 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 to a man to be respected, uh, being in PCC is a, a crucial uh, for, for, for him. So, the woman has this, this complex uh, relationship between the, the participation in the, in, the, in the criminal organization or not. So I would say that, that this tension is it's not black and white, it's not uh, so clear. So we have to see that uh, to be or not to be part of the criminal organization is always, uh, it's not uh, a simple decision. It's, we have to, to see what, what is the, the social uh, networks that this woman has in prison, that this, this woman has outside the prison. So this will say, this could say more about the, the, their role than be or not be a part of PCC. That's what, what I saw during the, the interviews. So it's a, a, a difficult uh, issue to answer in a simple way. Thank you, Ana Beatriz. Uh, one thing that came to my, my mind when you were speaking, it's something that I don't know about the PCC, but I know about um, Mexico, and probably it's related to how criminal organization had, um, you know, a long story in the case of Mexico. Um, do the delinquential families, criminal families exist in the case of PCC? Um, have you seen second generation of PCC members, for example, uh, reproducing patterns. I'm not talking only about women, of course, but in the case of Mexico, it's pretty clear how women may access to certain um, positions inside the criminal organizations because they are daughters or they uh, get married with someone with power. Getting married is not only a love story, the end of a love story, it's it's also an, a strategic decision. Um, it recalls me to when, you know, the royalty decided to whom you, in that case, you needed to be married with because you needed to expand your power and your territory. So in the case of Mexi in Mexico, it's pretty clear how these families um, deal with the business and involve their, their children in the business and how they manage to try to extend um, the domain of that particular family into different uh, territories of, of the country. So do you think there is something similar or they may be something similar? Maybe PCC is still too young um, to look at that. What do you think, uh, Marcos? I think that's uh, there's a little, that's a difference in the case of Mexico and when we look to the PCC because and given that uh, um, gangs that emerged from the prison, 
and not necessarily from a clan or a family in particular that dominate an area. And we see more horizontal and, or, uh, organization in the PCC in general. But at the same time, we see some uh, small changes in the role of women, not big changes as uh, Ana Beatriz told us, but for example, in the beginnings of PCC, the women has a role more concentrated in facilitate um, the entering of mobile phones in the prisons or even work uh, in, the, in the telephonic calls, to make this connection with the people outside and or uh, uh, in other words, more connected the, with the communication of the male that's arrested and the people outside uh, the prison. And we see that the, we have uh, a second generation that's not only connected with these roles uh, that's very connected with their partners and so on, but also sometimes linked to money laundering or people that not necessarily is connected with the, uh, with the leaders. But at the same time, we also see in some particular case in PCC and th the same roles of that we, we see in Mexico, like for example, the wife of key um, uh, leaders of PCC that has an important role in money laundering, for example. And how is for the policies difficult to, to arrest these people because and they do in, in a way and, and trying to, to put the, the organization and very far from these women in particular. So some leaders of PCC, clearly we see and her family have a very rich um, way, a mode of life, a way of life. And, it, 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 that in this way is, is similar to Mexico, but I think it, there are some exceptions. No? And, and I think it's a bit different because the, the PCC has, and um, we, some, several authors shows like for example, Camila Diaz and others shows that they have more a rational bureaucratic organization. It's not uh, from the charismatic domination like you see in Mexico, no? bringing the Weberian and, and conceptualization here. Now they, they are they work in the rational way. That's not necessarily is the clinic or the the traditional or the charisma that it's more important for the organization. But the role that the, the guy have in this rational bureaucratic organization in particular. Thank you. And do you think? Uh, and I'm um, passing the word to to Anna Beatriz. Do you think that also there may be um, a class issue there? I mean, of uh, the targets of the organization, and now especially thinking about women, maybe from a certain um, social class. I think that uh, in the beginning they were all in the same class, and I, and I think that it is important to add to the the what Marcos was saying that. Uh, some answers when I was uh, researching about uh, the the sisters and the sisters-in-law that I mentioned during my my speech, that uh, the leaders prefer not to baptize their wives into PCC to keep that that distance that uh, uh, makes the, their wives able to do the Monday laundry to to be a lawyer. So not be a sister, but only a sister-in-law is important to this, this, this separation. So, uh, and I think that in the beginning, uh, continue what I, what I was saying, they were all at the same uh, social class. I think that they were all at the peripheries, the, the, uh, they were not in the high classes of society. But when the PCC starts to make money with the drug traffic, and the leaders become rich. The leaders become to live in the great houses, in the in uh, the good uh, neighborhoods. These women are treated in a different way the, uh, from the the women that are in jail, the women that are in the, the street. So I think that there there's this difference because it's the 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 leader's wife. So we cannot touch in the leader's wife. We cannot. Uh, 
treat the same way the leader's wife as we we treat the woman that is in, that is in jail uh, uh, five years for, for for five years. So I think that there is today this 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 uh, this difference. But this difference is uh, after PCC became the major drug trafficker in Latin America. I think that in the beginning when we all they were. Uh, all at the same, uh, I can say, the, the same uh, state, the, the, the same class inside the jail and start the, the, the business. I think that there, there was this, this, this uh, different. But today, nowadays, we can say, well, uh, once I was interviewing um, a media report uh, and he was saying that uh, People, uh, and I'm not talking about women, I'm talking about the, the members in general, uh, people who is in the bottom of the, of the organization, they are seen as clowns that, that do all the dirty uh, job, but the money is with the, the top, with the leader. So I think that these, these differences is the same when we talk about the, the, wom the women in the top and the women in the bottom. So that's it. Thank you. Uh, one difference probably Carolina, next. Sorry. Yeah, of course. Can Go just ahead. add an important aspect from the, what Anna Beatrice told. And what, just one example on how sensitive is this, is this topic of the wife of the key members. And I remember that one interview and with a journalist that we did that understand a lot about PCC and not necessarily in this research, but a previous research. And he told for me and Ana Beatriz that we can mention any name from the, his interview about the PCC members, but not the wife names. Uh, uh, if you, uh, he told, if you publish the name of the leaders of PCC and so on, I don't have any problem. But if you publish any name from the people that is the family of these members, will bring some problem to me. And this is uh, shows how sensitive is this role of the of the wives and the daughters of these key members because they need to stay totally anonymous and to, to have this role in the organization. Yes. And of course, we don't publish and say sorry. any name from the ethics of this research or from this one. I, can, uh, sorry, Marcus. Uh, I can also say that I, I did an interview with the director of the, the criminal prosecute of uh, Sao Paulo, and he was saying to me that uh, if he don't mess with the family, the PCC leader don't mess with the, their family. So that's the, the the balance. So I'll keep the my my I'll keep my focus on the the leader. I'll keep my focus with the at the member, and I will not mess with the family. So my family is protected, and so that is the this this sensitive. In the in the whole situation, so uh, that's is what I, I want. Thank you. And that that it's very interesting because in the case of Mexico, it seems to be quite the contrary, right? Women are involved because they are part of these families. And I was thinking while you were talking about Carter Jalisco, new uh, new generation or nueva generación, when for some people we have interview. Um, the real one that the real one that has the power is not El Mencho, is Rosa, Rosalinda, um, which is the, the wife. Uh, she is the Gonzalez Valencia. She is not, uh, uh, you know, an anonymous woman. She comes from a criminal family. She has a history. Her uh, brother, she has a lot of brothers. I don't remember how much, but um, how many, but she has a lot of brothers. They are all involved in the business. So it may be um, quite different. And also something I wanted to add to what you were discussing is um, the idea of how money laundry and the class I, I ask you about may work together, at least in the case of uh, Mexico, it's pretty clear how class can be um, difficult to separate with move, the, the movement of money, right? If you are talking about high class woman, it's easier um, not to put the movement of money under the spotlight. So in many cases, 
cartels in Mexico will look for those women that may have uh, financial issues at the at this moment that but they have a last name they have a certain status and they can work as launderers for the money of the criminal organizations. Um, so last question, and we are almost running out of time. We have left 20 minutes and I will invite everyone to put um, questions in the Q&A section, please. Uh, so we can wrap up with the answers. Um, the last question I have prepared is, which are the main policy oriented recommendations you would suggest regarding the case of you're working in? I, I would say PCC in particular, and criminal organizations in Latin America in general. Whoever want to start first. And um, one thing uh, to deal with this, this complex criminal organizations with branches in drug trafficking, illegal media and so on, of course that we need strong intelligence. And even the, um, some people from, um, from the, the government that we talk, they they recognize the difficulties to to have an intelligence uh, gender driven to women in particular. You know? They they know the role, the importance in the money laundering and so on, but it's difficult, especially human intelligence, to be involved in this particular. It's quite easier, for example, this. So I think that. Is an aspect that we need to improve, not only in Brazil, but I think several countries. How we think also an in uh, policy intelligence and to deal with these transnational criminal organizations, and that also is oriented to to this role of women that um, each day is increasing. You no, know? and and it's quite interesting that, and I I had the opportunity to interview an official of intelligence in Brazil that's a woman and that's working with the, the PCC and so on. And the perspective is absolutely different when we talk with the colleagues that are men. They have the, they have, they, uh, she has the, the opportunity to know some um, topics because she's a woman that's absolutely different from the men that they were searching the organization. I think that from the, is from the other research that I'm conducting, but I think that one wasn't one of the more, that more clarified my idea about PCC because this, this woman in particular has some access that's impossible to a man have. You know? So I think the, the, the intelligence needs to improve and how we get not only the men to look to these, these topics, but the women also, because unfortunately, sometimes these gender roles and this inequality is also seen in the in our police, in our intelligence, and we need to deal with that. That's important to deal with this. You know? I would just to make uh, to make comment on this and leave to Annabelle Thank to the other topic that I I know that she she agree with me and. We talked before about this, the, the, this policy possibilities. <laughs> Would you like to add something, Ana Beatriz? Yes, I, uh, as Marcus said, we, we talked before, and I think that I will be more radical. Um, I think that taking into account that most women are arrested because they are caught in drug trafficking, both for their own livelihood and because of their partner's involvement sometimes, or, or I think that uh, uh, be a wife to someone that is uh, persecuted by drug traffic is a, uh, a crucial factor to put, it, put, on, put you on the prison. So, uh, and also consider that it is in prison that these women are um, engaged with PCC as we are uh, talking about PCC and other organizations that uh, were created in jail. The first step to discuss chains, real chains in the scenario is the decriminalization of, of drugs. So uh, it's, a, it's a difficult discussion, it's a stigma. It, it has a lot of moral questions that society uh, uh, raises. But uh, when we think about the cycle of victimization and criminalization of women, uh, uh, the, the, the criminalization of drugs 
of the the people who don't have the the women who don't have have uh, the way to to keep the the children to 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 maintain that 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 house that that home and and start to to uh, to drug traffic so. I think that this this discussion of drug uh, the the criminalization of drugs is 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 still um, necessary. I think that this is the first step when we talk about a real change uh, in in the scenario of uh, 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 organized crime and transnational uh, drug traffic. So I think that that's uh, what I can. First, uh, think when I when I think about policy-oriented recommendations, but as a it's a, a taboo. <laughs> Thank you. It is interesting because we are mainly focusing on a drug trafficking, but actually these criminal organizations do much more things, right? And we need to think about counterfeit, for example. Um, I don't know. Um, big C. Um, big, um, well, criminal things related to human smuggling, human trafficking, um, illegal mining, illegal lodging, a lot of things that are mainly not in the agenda, unfortunately, but we know that the crim this criminal organization has uh, diversified a lot. That's the case of uh, Mexican cartels without any doubt. Uh, we have seen in, in, in many different areas of the country. And also, I would like to, to bring back something that uh, Ana Beatriz mentioned at the beginning. She talked about how women are uh, connected to um, woman behavior had an easier entrance to the PCC. And that, for me, it's at, le at least is problematic, right? Because we need to add gender lens and forget about um, how women are supposed to look like, how women are supposed to uh, behave in terms of gender norms, if we want to have the full picture. We know that women have agency. I'm not talking about women in need. I'm not talking about women uh, that are vulnerable and, and need to work uh, at the bottom of the pyramid with a criminal organization, but I'm talking about women who decide uh, to get into the criminal organizations because they have uh, a desire for power, for money, whatever they may be, and they can reach a different position maybe in, in the middle uh, range um, or high range position. As I said, in the case of Mexico, clearly it may be different from the case of um, the PCC. But agency is something we need to be aware of, and strategic thinking is the other one. Otherwise, it's very difficult to develop um, policies that would actually uh, fight organized crime as a whole. Because if we have the, the men behind bars or dead, the woman will keep on um, working the business. And this is something that is happening right now in almost every country um, of the world. But to wrap up our session, we have only 12 minutes and we have two questions in the, in the Q&A and I would like to share it with you. Uh, Luan Silva makes uh, an introduction to the topic. Um, he knows that um, in general, black and peripheral women have been targeted of punitive policies and had led to mass incarceration for drug crimes, that was something that Ana Beatriz was mentioning, um, and she and he said that um, it says that pro prohibitionism is a form of drug regulation that allows the maintaining of a serial of discriminatory practice against social vulnerable groups. So um, he asked, how can we design alternative uh, drug policies um, that would make it possible to weaken the dimension of organized crime. And on the other hand, we have another question from Franco de Pietri, for Marcos especially. Uh, he says, do you think that the role of women are getting in politics now, nowadays will have an advantage in terms of criminal or hybrid um, governance? Who will kick off? And 
Yeah, and I think the the first question we covered in the in the ideas that Anna Beatriz shared with us. And, uh, and I agree that the, the decriminalization of some drugs would be useful to decrease the, the number of women in some prisons that and in particular, for example, in Sao Paulo State, Mato Grosso State, when we look at the PCC, become uh, more strong members of the organization sometimes because 10 grams of marijuana and so on. So I need to rethink some drug um, policies in Brazil. I, I agree with her in, in, this, in this way. And um, about the second question, and uh, do you think that the role of the women are getting in politics nowadays will be an advantage in terms of criminal hybrid governance? And it's difficult to, uh, in the case of Brazil, to, to have a clear perspective on this because unfortunately, the participation of women in politics in Brazil is quite low. You know? And, and I, we see some changes in this particular administration that, but even though um, is not as expected by the feminist movements and so on, the, the participation of women in, in, in politics. And we see some important initiatives like is the case where Ana Beatriz works you know, in the penitentiary system of Maranhão that most of the, the officers are women in particular and are, are changing the, the environment of the prisons in, in a state that's quite problematic 10, 15 years ago. But in politics, we don't have still a clear perspective because the, the number of women is still low and and not and in general not very involved in the public security issues with very few exceptions um, like uh, a representative from a pi state and and it's a very few cases Ana Beatriz some comment so I would like to add to this uh, comment uh, that Marcos has has done about uh, Nowadays, I work for, for penitentiary system here in Maranhão, north of, uh, of Brazil. And my boss, my direct boss is a, a, a woman. She is a, a, a policy officer uh, and, and she, she is uh, responsible to a great part of the change here in the system because nowadays we have uh, almost 100% of the interns, the, the, the arrested people, in educational educational politics, so they they are almost uh, the the totally of, of them are alphabetized. They they know how to read. They know how to write. And um, I think that the the role that this woman in particular is very uh, important to this to this change to have the 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 sensibility to realize that not only work for prisoners, but also education is essential to change the environment, to change the, the, the criminal governance. Because when we think that uh, the people, uh, the, a woman uh, enters in, in jail, now they, they become a, 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 an arrested uh, person. And they, 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 have the, they have to start all over again when they, they leave the, the prison. So when they have the opportunity to study, the opportunity to, to start to, to uh, develop a, a new ability, uh, a nail design and something like this, we have the, the possibility to change the, the environment outside the jail. So I think that this kind of politics that sometimes women are, are more uh, sensible uh, and I think that this is this is uh, important to to change the environment. That's it. Thank you something to add uh, regarding the idea of uh, criminal governance, not hybrid in this case, but in the case of Mexico, women had a big uh, part into um, organizing um, local 
communities, for example, providing goods in that local communities. So they have um, more power and they seem legitimized and they win legitimacy for the cartel. It's not the case of Jalisco Nueva Generación. Uh, we know that in the case of Jalisco, violence is the main um, tool used to rule. But in other cases, such as the case of the Sinaloa cartel, we have seen how important is the presence of um, the cartel providing goods and providing services. And I remember um, Alejandrina Guzman, which is uh, one of the sisters of Tapo, uh, she created a legal um, enterprise and she um, distributed a lot of goods during the pandemic in different um, spaces and she won a lot of uh, followers so to call them. Okay we have only five minutes I don't know if you want to add any comments so we can wrap up this um, table and we uh, will continue of course debating what happens in in these criminal organizations and the role of women. Yes, I just to thank. I think that was very interesting conversation here. And as I introduced in this in this round table, I am happy to see how this important topic is even more discussed. We have several panels in this event discuss the role of women. And we hope that this continues and not only the role of women in criminal organizations, but also combating criminal organizations I mentioned. It, no? How is the role of the, the state also engaging and more women in, in as officers, as intelligence officers and so on. I think this is very important also and we need also, I think the next step to discuss, not only to discuss um, the women as the problem, but also as the solution on working and as officers, as people that are dealing with this clear challenge that we have in Latin America. Thank you so much, Anna, Beatriz. I also would like to thank you. Uh, thanks, uh, Marcos, and thank you, Carol, for the questions. It was, I think that they were, they were precise and they, they uh, contribute a lot to our uh, debate. And uh, I think that the panel was very important, not only to discuss um, the women's role in criminal organization, but also uh, how um, women can, can be seen as, as a, a different uh, a person, a, a people who have, can make the difference in the in the in the discussions as we are here as women and uh, uh, taking part of this 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 discussion. So uh, thank you again, and um, I think that we have uh, other panels too uh, still. And uh, thank you it. so much. Yeah, thank you so much. I will. I would like to recommend every one of the attendees uh, to look for the. Um, um, for the records of the different um, different panels and roundtables we had during the day, I don't know if there is anyone any roundtable left regarding women in organized crime. There, but there were quite a few during the day. So if you are interested in the topic, I invite you to check on the webpage of the conference. You 